I will record the webinar. So you're live, okay? So again, welcome to um, our third webinar at the Florida Wine Academy. Our idea is to have webinars twice a week. So we'll do every Wednesday and then every Friday. Uh, if you are local in Florida, you have the chance of buying wines from us as well. So you can uh, play with us and also taste with us together. If you are elsewhere, try to find similar wines, or um, if we, um, you are in other places, okay, I, I think I have a crawling, <laughs> sorry about that, we saw you, Matias, it's okay, <laughs> poor kids, okay, so that happens, okay, <laughs> uh, yeah, poor guy, he was outside, I said, okay, I need to start the webinar, when you go, you know, make sure you do, don't do any noise, so um, I always think about that guy doing a live interview with CNN, and then the kids just, just come by, hey, Ann, good to see you. All right, so let's start with Sparkling Life. Um, so I chose this webinar because, you know, every time I'm, I'm teaching my level three, the advanced students, and um, we go into the sparkling wine class, you ask them, do you think you know about sparkling wine? And everybody says, I know everything. You know, it is so easy. Sparkling wine, yeah, no problem with that. And then I said, oh yes, really? Do you know that? The second fermentation in bottling for the, um, the champagne method adds 1.2 to 1.3% in alcohol. Then they look at me and said, what are you talking about? So um, I did a quiz on uh, Instagram this week asking how many methods are there. And uh, a lot of people uh, answer three methods and it is actually six. There is a couple more methods. Um, so I'm going to, you know, talk about... Um, a little bit about that today okay all right so uh, for those who do not know me my name is Alessandra Stavis I am the director of wine education for Florida Wine Academy uh, I have the diploma in wine and spirits the level four of the WSCT I have a champagne master level as well and a couple of other qualifications as you've seen here and the most recent one is that I'm studying for the masters of wine program so I am a Master of Wine candidate. This is a very long program, very difficult one. Um, so I'm doing that right now. Okay, so for the Florida Wine Academy, I take care of the wine education. And I have a couple of people in here that works with us. So Nicole Ramos, wave Nicole. Nobody can see you, but they can see you on the chat. Then I have the Insane for Champagne lady, so Brenda. Uh, Brenda also uh, helps us with marketing. So, um, wave Brenda, yes, okay. And I don't know if Celeste is in here as well, but if Celeste is, say hi to everybody as well, okay? So uh, this is my team and uh, I have my partner, Guilherme de Macedo, working with me as well. He will present a webinar about sake. It's a free webinar, go join so you can um, explore it and understand a little bit about sake, okay? All right, um, so things that we do at the Florida Wine Academy, because it's such a fun company. So uh, we have 305 wines, so we sell wine. If you need wine in Miami now, we deliver, same day delivery, and uh, all these wines are available. Couple of states allow us, uh, Texas do not allow us to ship. I think North Carolina either, so, uh, but we do sell wines as well. We have a wine conference called Vino Summit. We did that. Beginning of the month, it seemed like a year ago because, you know, March 2020 is the longest month of our lives. And then we do Miami Champagne Week, and that is really fun. So Miami Champagne Week will be in October this year, hopefully. So hope to see you there. All right. Okay, so champagne and sparkling wines are the wines for celebration. So I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, it's very interesting, and, and the wines are amazing, too. Okay, so a couple of questions before we start. So, did Dom Perignon, who lived from 1639 to 1715, invent champagne? What do you guys think? Okay, you guys learned something, you know, or you guys are, are learning. Everybody's saying no, okay. Yes, thanks to Vino Summit. <laughs> yeah. 
Exactly. So, you know, he was a monk, very good, Heidi, by the way, hi. Uh, so he was a very, very important guy. So he took care of the vines. He separated, you know, the, the white grapes from the black grapes. He um, um, invented or discovered that a very slow pressing, you don't extract any color from the skins. So yes, he, he was producing steel wine at that moment. Um, but he did not invent any wine, okay? So Moet Chandon, they own the name, and that is why they have Dom Perignon. And so there is a legend that he says that first he was blind, which is not true, and then when he tasted champagne, he said, come quickly, I'm tasting the stars. Not true. It is just a legend, you know, how some more wine. It's beautiful. And I can have a bottle of Dom Perignon in here and see the stars as well. So, but not true, he did not invent champagne, okay? So I saw that Natalie said that was the monks in Limou that invented champagne. So did the monks in Limou invent sparkling wine? What do you guys think? Okay, so Antonio says no. Ooh. <laughs> okay, Anna says yes. Irene says yes. Okay. In Saint for Champagne says England. How is this possible? English people could not do any wines until very recently. Isn't true, Sarah? Um, so Sarah is um, is uh, trying to do a sparkling English sparkling wine class with us. She says not true. So Bronda is asking, uh, where is Limou? So Limou is in southern France. Uh, and it is a kind of cool area in southern France because there is altitude. And they were producing sparkling wine. So uh, Francesco says Italian Prosecco comes before Champagne. Um, that was a very Italian thing to say, Francesco. So actually, you know, the monks in Limou they did not invent sparkling wine because they had no idea what they were doing, okay? So the wines that they produced had a little bit of bubbles, but they thought this was something from the spirits or something that, um, you know, it was not on purpose. So um, the real guy who invented, documented, and invented the sparkling wine as we know nowadays was an English guy. Yes. So Christopher Moret. He was a physician and a scientist, and um, he documented the deliberate addition of sugar in the production of sparkling wine in 1662. So he said, by adding sugar and yeast to a wine, you can produce the bubbles, okay? So he was the, the, the first guy to say this. So, yes, Christopher is saying that the Claret de D dates back to the third century. Yes, but in this case, it is one fermentation only, and it is the ancestral method, which we are going to see in a second, Christopher. So, you know, the real sparkling wine, as we know as today, um, was invented by the English. And the reason for that is, first, they had uh, the glass. Because, you know, all the glass made in Europe was too fragile. So when they, they, um, they invented this really robust uh, and durable bottle, yes, exactly. That is when he could, you know, make uh, sparkling wine deliberately. Okay? It is not on chance, but they really made it. So, um, yeah, nobody will tell you, right? If you go to Dom Perignon in Champagne and you ask, did Dom Perignon invent champagne? They'll say yes, okay? But now you know it was a guy. And I can send you this presentation later, so don't worry about it, okay? All right, so with that, um, we begin with the first method to produce any wines. And this is called the rural or ancestral method. So basically what happens was, you know, I'm fermenting wine, I put inside the bottle, and this is one fermentation only. So I had a very young wine with a little bit of sugar, and then the fermentation will continue in the bottom. Okay, so what I have at the end is a very lightly sparkling wine. So not fully sparkling as a champagne is nowadays, but just a little bit of fizziness, just a little bit of bubbles, okay? This is still used today. So yes, the Claret de D, the Blanquet de Limoux, all of this is still used that, 
Um, and the pack nets that are uh, done nowadays all use this method, but it's one fermentation only. So it has nothing to do with the champagne method, okay? So um, very ancestral way of doing things. You cannot control the amount of sugar in the end. You cannot control the amount of bubbles in the end. And nowadays, you know, when people do the pet net, is to be something very, very uh, natural, okay? So um, any questions so far? All good? You're thirsty, right? But I'll make you suffer. So hang on, you know, first wine is coming soon. So just bear with me for a second. All right. So then we have um, another method, which is called carbonation. And carbonation is the Coca-Cola method, right? You just put bubbles into the wine. That is the cheapest method and largest bubble. Do you think the wine is going to be, you know, very high quality? What do you guys think? No, yeah, of course not, right? Okay, so now let's go to tank method, okay? So tank method, it's called Charmat method by the French, um, and then the Martinelli method for the Italians. If you talk to an Italian, the Italian will say, yes, we invented this method. If you talk to the French, they will say, the French invented this method, but it was really uh, the Charmat. Um, he's a sci he was a scientist and he invented. So basically, um, it's the following. For any high quality sparkling wine, you need two fermentations, okay? So first fermentation, you harvest your grapes, you press the grapes, you make a dry base wine. So think about a Chardonnay, not that one that the guy used, but a Chardonnay or a Pinot Noir, okay? Finish, steel wine, complete, you can drink that. So that is the first fermentation. Now, you're going to prepare this wine for a second fermentation. So in the case of tank method, you put this in, inside a tank, um, which is, you know, can be an autoclave, so you can hold the bubbles inside. You put sugar and you put yeast, and the sugar will consume the yeast and will generate bubbles and a little bit more alcohol. So now you have a sparkling wine, okay? Tank is very used for aromatic grapes like Lambrusco, Prosecco, and some Riesling sparkling wines. So any questions about tank method? Do you all, have you all you know, heard about it, seen before? I'm sure you drink before because you all drink Prosecco, you know? So, yes, okay, so all good. All right, so with that, we will open our first wine, okay? <clears throat> so uh, the first wine we chose is Frico, is a Lambrusco, sparkling. And the reason that I chose this wine is because we had Jacqueline Coleman. Uh, you can follow her, she's right here. Hey, Jackie. So Jacqueline, um, she has an Instagram called at History and Wine. She writes for um, um, magazines, newspapers, and she tasted this wine uh, a couple of uh, months ago, I guess, and she highly recommended it. So we wanted to have, you know, a good value and a good cane wine for, um, the, for 305 wines, and so we bought them, okay? So go ahead and open your Lambrusco for those of you who have it. Um, <clears throat> yes, Pedro, I will talk about that in a second. Good call, yes. All right, so the method for this wine, it is not the carbonation, it is actually Charmant, okay? So it is tank method. So it is not the carbonation in here, it is Charmant. Grapes for this wine, so we have Lambrusco and they use three types of Lambrusco. So yes, the, the Graspa, Graspa Rosa is the highest quality one. Is, you know, people say it has a little bit of almond notes. Then the Salamino has this name because, you know, it looks like a salami because it is very long. When you see the grape bunches, it's very long and narrow. So it looks like a salami, really. And uh, gives aromas of red cherry. And then the Maestri is, you know, more planted nowadays. It is a very hardy and resistant grape. Uh, you can find this Lambrusco Maestri nowadays in, in Mendoza, in Argentina. You can find it in Australia as well. 
So um, you can find all of that, okay? Uh, this Frico uh, is coming from the IGT Emilia, okay? So it is the whole of Emilia Romagna. It's not only, you know, uh, a DOC or DOCG. Uh, if you see our IGT on the label, it seems, yes, is a larger region of production and 9.5% ABV. So um, first, I want you to drink this directly from the can, and then we'll pour into a wine to see the color. So cheers, guys, okay? I have my speed tuning here. I'm still working. I know it is Friday. I promise not to spit, you know, all the wines, but yes, so... Okay, all right, now let me pour into a white wine glass so you can see the color and the bubbles. Oh wow, this is deep purple. See, the color. And yeah, it has some bubbles, but you know, now I don't see any more in my glass. <clears throat> Smells like a red wine. Hey Carla. Um, okay, what do you guys think? So, the wine smells like cherry, like cherry jam. Like you are opening um, a jar of cherries. So, I think it is really, um, you know, it is... Normally, people associate Lambrusco with sweetness. This is not too sweet. It is just, you know, enough to be uh, round and smooth. And um, it has kind of a meaty characteristic as well. So let me see what you guys say. So not bad, says Claudia. Brenda, I will ignore you, okay? So um, I did not think it was going to be that dark red. I know, because, but you know, Lambrusco is a red grape, so that is why. So yes, Nicole is saying that it has red and black fruits, doesn't carry the sugar that people associate with Lambrusco. I completely agree. Uh, we, I couldn't find the technical sheet saying the amount of sugar in this wine. We know there is some, okay? Antonio says he will take it to a picnic. Totally agree. Uh, for us living in Miami, that boat life is, um, you know, it's a good life. I think this is going to be great in boats where you cannot take any glass bottles. So, yes, it is, you know, refreshing and delicious. Mary Beth says uh, she will drink in a sunny day. Yes, much nicer uh, than anticipating and says... Little tart, yes, we totally agree with you. So, um, yeah, so all Italian wines, first they have very high acidity, and then they have this tart, tart uh, red fruit. So, um, so yes, it's very tart. So, meatiness, strawberry jam, yes, beautiful color, very smooth. Um, okay, Lambrusco, so Lambrusco is a grape but it's um, also a style of wine, okay? It's just like Prosecco. Prosecco, you know, Glera was, um, was a synonym for Prosecco. So yes, Lambrusco is, um, is a, a blend of grapes. Yes, all Lambrusco. Very innovative and modern to get it from a can, okay? All right, so one question that I have for you guys. Is it different to taste from the wine glass and to taste from the can? Try to, you know, taste it again and try to feel how the bubbles, how, how you feel it. Okay. So some people are saying fresher from a can, easier from a can, I agree. Irene says better in the wine glass. Yes, Anna is saying more bubbles in the can. Yeah, agreed. Probably because, you know, the can, because of also the format. So for those of you who have the can, this is not, you know, a big, thick can. It is very slim. So probably that mimics the shape of a flute, right? 
See the flute in the can? And for those of us tasting the white wine glass, you lose the sparkle and the bubbles really soon. Yeah. Okay. Does the can affect of or impart flavor? It shouldn't. So nowadays, these cans, they are prepared to, to hold the wines for longer. Normally, there is, um, it is not directly in contact with the aluminum. So you have something inside the can. So the technology is advancing a lot. So that is why you can have, you know, um, quality wine inside a can as well. All right, so um, Frico by Scarpetta has nothing to do with the Scarpetta restaurants, okay? This is just a group of people who loved Italian wines, uh, decided to bring some wines to the US. Um, so they have red wines, white wines, rosé wines, and they have the can as well, okay? Yes, Francesco is saying uh, the taste from the glass is better. Yes, um, you know, now it is uh, personal opinion. We will discuss that shortly. Um, uh, to see, you know, which one likes the flute or the glass. All right, all good until now. All right. Okay, so um, perfect pairing with a Lombrusco is salami, prosciutto, formaggio, parmigiano. Yes, perfect with cold cuts. Ciao, Alessandro. So, yes, are you eating something? Yes, okay. I have one snack for me. So I have a Brazilian pão de queijo for me in here that I stole from, from my kids so I can taste with the wines later. Leticia is saying not yet. Alexa has charcuterie. Lucy is saying I'm dying for this, for the pão de queijo. I need a caipirinha. <laughs> I can have with champagne, okay? So it's okay. So Claudia, yes, it's too early in Dallas to have something. Yes, um, but you know, the Emilia Romagna is where you have the prosciutto di Parma, the Parmigiano Reggiano, is where you have the vinegar, the, the aceto balsamico. So all of that comes from that region. So, you know, the Bolognese. So definitely, you know, Think about that saying that what goes together, what grows together, goes together. So yes, if you find this food in the region, this wine will be perfect with the food um, in the region, okay? All right, so ready for the next wine? All right, so please dump your, um, if you haven't, you know, drank it all, so dump your wines. Uh, just, you know, clean your glasses, add a splash of water or wine to your glass so we can move to the next one. Um, yes, so Pedro is saying that that region in Italy has very informal wines. So yes, you know, wines in Italy, they are still made to consume with food. It is liquid food, so they are just part of it. So yes, okay. So Mary is having the Riesling. Okay, so wine number two is the Riesling. So go get it if you have it, okay? I'll talk about, the re, uh, about this Riesling soon. Let me open my wines. You know, the good thing about doing those webinars on Friday is that I have a lot of wines for the weekend, so I don't have to worry about it. Don't you think so? Okay, I don't have my guy to open the bottles in here, so I hope I don't make a very loud pop so you know oh my it's it's a, you know be happy i cannot hear you guys so if you do pop with the it wasn't too bad okay <laughs> all right <clears throat> so wine number two is dr luzen uh dr l sparking Weasley. Okay, that is a non-vintage. Method in here is Charmat, so tank method, just like Prosecco, just like the previous wine. Grape, in this case, is 100% Riesling. Comes from the Mosa in Germany, and uh, we'll talk about residual sugar in a second. So, yes, you can see it, sorry. So it is in here, 
So Dr. L, um, yeah, it's, you know, an entry level wine for Dr. Luzen. They have a, a, <clears throat> another wine that is traditional method, uh, method champenoise. In this case, it's their entry level wine, okay? So I want you to do two things. And so um, as I promised, I was going to show you the wine glasses. Let me do this right now before I make a mess of auto, uh, everything. <clears throat> so uh, this is a modern coupe. Uh, so the coupe was this very open glass of champagne that you see in James Bond movies and so on. Um, not too great for the bubbles, not too great for the aromas, and that is why we don't use it anymore, okay? This one appears to be fancy, but actually, you know, I, I have a problem with it. It is not, it does not fit well. The aromas are not so good. So, you know, it is beautiful, but not very practical. The second wine glass that we have for sparkling wines Okay, so Leticia is telling me that she cannot um, see the presentation. Can you guys see the presentation? Uh, she says that it is in Zoom. Yeah, okay, everybody can see. So maybe Leticia, it is, it is about your uh, settings. Um, yeah, go ahead. Hey, Susan. So, okay, everybody can see. Check, take a look on, on your settings. All right, so the second type of glass, it is the flute. Okay, so the flute, it is great for the bubbles. It keeps the bubbles inside. You just saw that with the can, right? Now for the aromas, not mm -hmm. very good, but definitely if you like bubbles, if you like the texture, this is the glass for it, okay? Now, um, because nowadays the aromas are very important for any wine, Rido developed the tulip. So the tulip, is basically a, fruit, a flute, but is a little bit more wide open. Can you see the difference? Yeah. So this glass, um, you know, is a very thin crystal as well. It is handmade. Um, it's a nightmare. You cannot put it in your dishwasher. You have to wash it by hand. But it is great for tasting sparkling wine because it is not super white, but just wide enough that you can have the bubbles and have the aromas as well. So this is one of my favorite uh, champagne glasses or sparkling wine glasses, okay? Costs a fortune. I don't know, I think each glass costs around $50. I got two for one Christmas, broke one, and then I had to wait for the other Christmas to get another one, okay? So, so just telling you, all right? Okay. So then Rido did something else. They invented a glass for vintage champagne. So now you see it's a little bit more wide open than the flute or the tulip, but it's not as, um, you know, you see the difference in the bowl shape. So this is white wine glass and this is the vintage champagne. So yes, you have a very wide, wide, bowl but then it closes again back to concentrate the aromas on the nose so um, this is great so I use that um, a lot more a lot more often and I do put it on the dishwasher so it is dishwasher safe um, yes and it is beautiful as well okay so this is Rito again for vintage champagne and then you have um, um, the white wine glass, which, you know, now it is a trend. Everybody's asking for the white wine glass because, you know, the aromas are going to be much more prominent in a white wine glass, okay? So that is what I want you to do. Pour the Dr. Luza in the flute. And then pour, if you have the white wine glass, Pour the Dr. Luzen in the white wine glass as well, and we'll discuss. So Natalia is saying she loves Rito and Zalto glasses. Yes, I have two Zalto glasses at home. I was telling in the past webinar, I was telling people that those two Zalto glasses are mine, and I am the one who uses it. Not, nobody else is allowed to use them, okay? All right, so um, I have two wines in here. 
So first, try to look at the bubbles. If you see, you know, if they are different or similar or something else. For me, um, I don't have a lot of bubbles on my, my flute and neither in my white wine glass. So Lucy is uh, asking if she can use, I know, so the ISO glasses for sparkling wine. Yes, we use that in class all the time. Okay, go ahead and smell. Oh my, we don't have bubbles either. Uh, Elizabeth is saying, let me see. We have a couple of other questions in here. So, okay. So try to compare and contrast the aromas. Oh my. For me, the aromas are completely different. So, you know, you go and smell the flute. You have some apples, you have some, you know, fresh fruit. And then when you smell uh, the white wine glass, the, it is so much more aromatic. You have um, peaches and apricots and flor floral. So it is a lot more aromatic. Guys, what do you think? Are you tasting as well? Okay, let me see what people are saying. Um, so yes, I got pear in the wine glass, very few aromas. Okay, so um, during Miami Champagne Week and then during Vino Summit, we had a master sommelier and you know, he's a great presenter, Matt Citrilla, he's an amazing, he knows a lot about sparkling wine. And he says that we shouldn't say one glass is better than the other. It is all about personal preferences. Some people love uh, white wine glasses because they love the aromas, and some people will love the flute because of the bubbles. So now go ahead and taste the wines and pay attention about the sensation in your mouth, in your, you know, like we did with the can, to see if you find, you know, more bubbles uh, in the flute or more bubbles in this glass, okay? Yeah, so Claudia is saying very aromatic in the wine glass, I agree. Nicole is saying flora and pretty, okay. Anna is saying very sweet. Good girl, okay. All right. So, yes, Nancy is saying fruity and sweet like a juice. Yes, you got it. Okay, so as I said... This is um, the entry level for Dr. Luzen. It is Charmat. When people use Charmat method, what they want to do is have the expression, the fruity aromas of the wine, okay? So you don't have any toast. You don't have any, um, you know, brioche type of aromas. So in here, it's all about the fruit. So yes, great wines for a Sunday morning by the pool. Okay, um, so let's see. Smoother in the wine glass. I agree with Antonio. It is. It is very smooth. Um, more bubbles in the flute, but you can taste more the fruits and sweetness in the wine glass. Absolutely. I agree with that. So when you taste on the flute, it's not that sweet. And then when you taste in the white wine glass, for some reasons you have all these fruits and then, you know, the sweetness comes through as well. Okay. So, um, for the residual sugar. So Riesling is a grape that has very high acidity, but super high acidity, which is great for food pairing, okay? So if you're eating the popcorn or the charcuterie, it is great with it. Um, acidity is something that makes you salivate because your body understands acidity as something, you know, bad. So it produces saliva because it, it wants to get rid of this. So um, one of the tricks we do in class at the Florida Wine Academy is basically you take a sip of wine, you spit and dr or drink, put your head forward just like this and open your mouth. 
and you see, you know, the saliva coming and you have to close your mouth before all the saliva comes. So that is the high acidity. Okay, so Riesling is super high in acidity. The Mosel in Germany is a very, very cool area. So you are in a cool climate with very high acidity, so you have to have a little bit of sugar to compensate and to give some balance, okay? So normally wines that are brut have up to 12 grams of sugar per liter. So meaning I take a bottle of wine and I open, you know, if I had a one liter bottle, I open 12 packages of sugar and put inside the bottle. So in this case, 12% alcohol, Fabian. Um, what do you guys think is the sugar content in this wine? Do you, so Brut is up to 12 grams per liter, okay? This is not a Brut. So how much sugar do you think there is inside this, um, this wine? Any gases? Fourteen, fifteen, twenty-six. Okay, twenty-four. Okay. Um, thirteen point five. Irene, that is very precise. <laughs> um, okay, twenty, twenty-five. Jose, all right. It is actually nineteen grams. So it is, it is a lot of sugar, but I would say, you know, you cannot taste that amount of sugar. Uh, it, is, it is not too bad. So uh, I think the wine is very balanced. Uh, what do you guys think about the wine? It is, this is a, what, $12.99 or $14.99 bottle of wine. So again, it is not very expensive. Um, you know, 100% Riesling. I think it is a great wine for... Um, Yes, pool, pool wine. What do you guys think? Yeah, so Nicole is saying uh, that it is an alternative to something made in a similar way to Prosecco. And I agree. So yes, it is something, you know, similar to Prosecco, but now made with Riesling. Um, and I like it too. Great for boating, agreed Fabian. Yes, aperitif wine, Irene is, you know, just perfect for aperitif, um, serve a glass, great with food. Yes, Nancy prefer more sparkling wines with more lees, more complexity. We are getting there, Nancy. Pedro says fish tacos and habanero salsa. That's great. Brunch wine, yes, agreed with Jacqueline. Okay. Yes, fresh summer option. Okay. Yeah, that's precisely, you know, it is a $12.99, $14.99 bottle of wine. So it is, it is not about the complexity, okay? It is a, a method to produce fresh young wine, all right? Okay. And here is a picture of the Mosel Valley. And um, so, yes, you see all the vineyards in here in very steep slopes. Um, it's a very cool climate region located in the 50th parallel. Uh, you have vineyards on slope, but it's very hard to, to work on them, um, you know, but the Germans do produce um, a variety of, of very high quality sparkling wines. Me and some people in this chat, we were at Dr. Luzen two years ago, so Nicole, Brenda were there with me as well, and, you know, we met Ernie Luzen, who's, who's the guy um, who owns this winery. He's a... Um, a very, how can I say that? A very, um, you know, he has his, oh my gosh, help me with the word eccentric. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Yes, thank you, Pedro. He's eccentric. He's an eccentric guy, but he was one of the Germans who focused on exporting his wines. Um, most of the Germans, they, you know, they keep the production uh, inside the country. They export about 2%, 3%. Germany is the country that consumes the most amount of sparkling wine in the world, per capita, of course, so no, per person. Um, and, and he was the one exporting everything. So his wines are really well known in the US, okay? All right, all good. 
So let's go all the way down to Tasmania. Have you been to Tasmania? Because I have not. Have you been to Tasmania, guys? Okay, I wish. I wish to. No? Yes. I'm here in Australia. Hi, Maria Cecilia. Okay, where, where are you in Australia? And, you know, what time is in Australia right now? I remember I had a person registering for Australia. Okay, in Melbourne. Okay, yes. Uh, what time is it now? Are you, you know, in the future? 9.52 a.m. Yes. So how does the future look like? A little better than the past? <laughs> okay, not really. Yeah, tough times. All right. Let's focus on wine then. Uh, so, okay, so finally we get to traditional methods, okay? So if you see the presentation as I was moving, carbonation, I had two lines, you know, tank method, I had maybe three lines, traditional method, that is the huge amount of things that I have in here. This is a very difficult and costly process. So next time you ask yourself, why does a champagne cost so much more than a Prosecco? This is it, okay? It is so hard to do it. It takes so much time. So that is why um, it is so hard. So let me break it down a little bit. You know, I, I do not plan on Friday night to give you a lecture on traditional method sparkling wine. We can do that again. So I'll go over it really quickly. If you have any questions, let me know or... Um, because yes, that's, you know, we can do two hours on traditional method only, okay? Um, so Nancy is asking, when I say the Germans consume the most sparkling, is it sparkling Riesling that they drink? Oh no, they drink champagne. And in fact, they have a huge influence in champagne as well. If you see houses like Krug or Dots or, um, so, you know, they are all over champagne as well. So these are all German names. So they consume uh, Prosecco, Cava, Sparkling Riesling, Champagne, everything. Everything that has bubbles, um, they, they do consume a lot, okay? All right, um, so for, <clears throat> for a traditional method, we start with harvest. Harvest has to be done by hand, okay? You cannot have machine harvest. So please, you know, take that into account for the, the, the cost. Then we have pressing. So you have the bunches of grape and you are going to press them and you have to press it really gently. So the Champagne region, for instance, they, uh, they control how much you press out of the grapes. So if you need more money and you say, I'm gonna press these grapes as much as you can, no, you cannot, okay? So pressing is controlled. And then again, the pressing is really soft because you're producing um, white wines like champagne from black grapes. So the pressing needs to be soft and gentle, okay? And then you make the base wine, okay? So yes, you have sugar in the must. The yeast will consume the sugar, generating alcohol, so you have a base wine. And this base wine is just your regular base wine. Um, that has, you know, around 10, 11% in alcohol, okay? Okay, so after that, um, you go and prepare this wine for tirage, and tirage in French means bottling. So that means what I'm going to do is that, let me get a real bottle in here to show you. Let me move this, okay. So you take the base wine, Put in this bottle, put sugar and yeast, put a crown cap and let it age, okay? So the sugar will eat the yeast, generating CO2, but now the CO2 is trapped inside a bottle. So it will be dissolved into the wine, okay? So when we say second fermentation in the bottle, that's what I mean. So everything happens inside the bottle. Not inside tanks, like we saw, we saw for the Prosecco or for the sparkling Riesling, but inside an individual bottle. So meaning if I'm producing one million bottles, it is one million fermentations that I have to take care. So yeah, it is pretty intense, okay? Next, 
you have this aging on the lease, okay? So the aging on the lease, meaning it is how much time this wine will be in contact, uh, in contact tact with the yeast. So that is called autolysis, this is the term. And we have a law saying how much time we need. So you can read here in the presentation, so minimum nine months for cava, 12 months for non-vintage champagne, 36 months for vintage champagne, nine months for the Zacht made in Germany, 18 months for a French Accorta, okay? So uh, if I wanna produce a Prosecco in two months, I can. If I wanna do a champagne in two months, I cannot because only the aging part is 12 months, okay? And a lot of good producers will do much more than that. So, you know, it is not only a very costly and difficult process, but it also takes time, okay? So after all of that, sorry, uh, what you have to do is remove the sediment. So um, we do that by doing the remouage or riddling. So basically you turn these bottles upside down so you have all the sediment in the neck of the bottle. Because remember from the first video when the guy splashed all the sediment in himself, so you have to get rid of that, okay? And, you know, a true story is, was that um, champagne, when it had bubbles, it was a very cloudy wine. And so that is why you had all these crystals that we see in our grandmother's house, like, you know, yellow crystal, um, um, blue crystal, green crystal, and because it was a, a, a cloudy wine. So then it was Madame Clicquot, so Vouf Clicquot, that invented this way of removing the sediment, okay? So you remove the sediment and then you add, you know, a little bit of wine, a little bit of sugar, if it is the case, you put the cork and it is ready to go. So um, seems easy, it is not so easy. Okay, nowadays, of course, you have machines uh, to do that, but it's still a very long and costly process. So that is why every wine made with traditional method, it is going to cost a lot more, but you know, we will have other characteristics that we like as well. We'll have different aromas and flavors, and that is what we are seeing now, okay? So any questions, any comments? You're all too quiet. So either, you know, I lost connection, and I'm here talking to myself, or it is too complicated for a Friday night. So, yes. Okay, Pedro, you're here with me. At least one. All right. Um, okay, so Danny asked about the ice version of sparkling wines. Oh, okay, I never tasted those. But basically, it's just your regular champagne that you put on ice and, and do a cocktail. So, yes, okay. Um, all right, so we are going to open the Jens Tasmania, and I'll talk about the, this, um, this producer in a second. So go ahead and open, okay? Yes, Eduardo is drinking, Elizabeth is drinking this Tasmania. You guys are all, you know, so I'm talking here alone, all by myself, and you guys are drinking and just enjoying it, yeah? Okay. Um, all right. Thanks, Lee. It is possible to feel tannins in a rose sparkling wine. Absolutely, Antonia. We do feel uh, tannins as well. This is a very light rose. The color is, uh, I don't want to pop. I don't have my guy opening it here. Normally, I do have him. Yeah. You are not supposed to do that. Okay, guys? All right, so, um, so let me pour the wine and show you. This is a rosé, so Jens Tasmania, sparkling rosé. It is a little bit of rosé, um, yeah, like salmon, very pale salmon color, okay? So this is traditional method, and guess what? In Tasmania, they have a name for it. It is called méthode tasmanoise, okay? So for you guys that have the bottle, go into the back of the bottle and it says on the fourth line, it says Metod Tasmanuas. So go in here. 
which is the method Champagne was, but they cannot use it because uh, the Champagne region does not allow you to use method Champagne was, so they use the method Tasmanoise, okay? So yes, traditional methods, okay? They use um, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, so just like Champagne. Um, and yes, made in Tasmania, Australia. So, okay, Pedro, you say flash frozen. Yes, it is a brine freezing solution. Okay, pale rosé. Agreed, uh, Claudia. It's very pale in color. Maria Cecilia is asking, how long can I keep a champagne? So, um, champagnes, because of high acidity, you can keep them for a very long time. The only thing is that after a while, they lose the bubbles a little bit. So, if you like bubbles, you better consume them young. If not, um, you know, you can let them age. So, um, what are you supposed to do when opening? I'm gonna show you with the Bollinger. Maybe I'll have a better look, I'll stand up to, to, um, to make sure. I'll show you, okay. Um, what makes a sparkling wine lighter or darker in color? It's just adding a little bit of uh, red wine into it. Okay, Danny? How about after open? How long they last? Very good question, Anna, because I know you're thinking about Sunday already, right? And having to say, okay, I have to keep some of these wines for Sunday. So actually there is, let me reach out in here. So there is, there are closures uh, for champagne bottles. So the normal closure, you know, you cannot put a cord back. So you have closures just like this. I don't have it for sale now. I hope, you know, we will in the future. So I don't know if you can find them on Total Wine. So basically what you do is that, you know, you put it in here and you close and then the pressure is still inside the bottle. And that will last for a week. So yes, Lucy is saying two to three days. At the Florida Wine Academy, we have, you know, done a um, couple of tests and uh, that holds about a week. Um, there are different formats. So this one, for instance, is Charles Heitzig. So it is special for their bottle. This one, you know, goes to every bottle. So you have spe special closures. Um, but yeah, so what I would say, tonight you drink, you know, your favorite one. Um, Yes, and you go from there. And then tomorrow you drink your second favorite one. They will last until Sunday for sure, okay? So how much does a champagne cost from Tasmania? So champagne does only come from France. You cannot use champagne uh, for anything else. So you can say uh, a sparkling wine from Tasmania. This one is $22, I guess. So we sell them and it is a very good value, okay? All right, so um, let's go ahead and taste. By the way, this one ages for 24 months, okay? So probably you see the aromas of bread or yeast in here as well. So what can you smell? Yeast, okay? Agreed, Claudia. Anything else, any fruits? Think about the raspberries, strawberries, right. How is this strawberry? Is it like strawberry jam, like we saw in the Lombrusco, or is it more like fresh strawberries? Yes, so fresh strawberries, agreed, Sarah. It, it does have something of a tropical fruit, Nancy, I agree with you. So, um, yes, strawberries and cream. Okay, sounds good to me. Yes, um, exactly. You know, this wine uh, has been through malolactic fermentation, which is something to make the wine softer and smoother. So definitely you have, you know, a, a little bit of creaminess. So one of the things when we analyze uh, sparkling wines is that we see how creamy is the mousse, okay? So the mousse is something when you put the wine in your mouth, you analyze how the bubbles react. So you can have very aggressive bubbles, and then you can have very creamy bubbles. And in this case, I'll say that the bubbles, they are creamy, they are delicate. Um, yeah, so very good wine. 
Okay, go ahead, taste it. If you haven't, well, you all are drinking it. Who am I kidding, right? So, okay, what do you guys think? Okay, so Rhonda is saying she's drinking uh, better in the wine glass versus the flute. I completely agree, Rhonda. Very rarely I drink um, any sparkling wine in the flute, and if I do, it is that larger flute, the tulip, okay? So Sarah is asking, in my opinion, how would I distinguish this from a rosé champagne? So this one is still very fruity. So you know you are in the new world, not being in Europe, because it's very fruity. Uh, it's very fruit forward. So if it, you put a champagne next to it, the champagne will be so much more austere. You have so many of the red brioche and yeast. Also in champagne, we use reserve wines, not this case in this one. So this is fresh and fruit and lively. And um, yes, it is, you know, it is a new world sparkling wine. You can see that. Okay, um, more clown products on the mouth than on the nose. Yes, love, love the fruit and crispiness. Okay. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think this is a huge quality for, for uh, the sparkling wine. And, you know, to tell you a little bit about Jens, so um, Jens is in Tasmania. Tasmania is a very cool region in Australia because this is an island, it is in the south. And um, so the Jens brand was created in 1986 and was a joint venture with Louis Roderer. So Roderer is uh, the one producing Cristal Champagne. Um, so, you know, it was one joint venture that they, they had for about 10, 11 years. So, so yes, you know, they brought the method and the knowledge um, to, to the place to make great sparkling rosé. Yes, it is really great value. I agree, Sarah. I think Jens is, you know, one of these wines. I use it a lot for the classes we use on level three frequently because first, you know, nobody has tasted a, a wine from Tasmania. Have you guys tasted a wine from Tasmania before? Very difficult to find, right? So I used to, to, um, to, um, to try to find as many lines, and, and now I do have a distributor, and, you know, we buy this by cases, okay? All right, so Elizabeth is asking, how come the bubbles disappear much faster than champagne? Depends on the champagne again. So there is a theory um, that says, the longer time on the leaf, so the longer that aging with the sediment goes, the finer the bubbles will be and the more bubbles you see. So that is a theory. This wine, as I told you, it is 24 months uh, with the leaves. Um, so that is a theory, okay? So, but there are a couple of things that disrupt the bubbles. Uh, one of them is lipstick. So if you wear lipstick and the lipstick normally has a lot of you know, fat or oily um, components, when you, you, your mouth hits the bubbles, it kills the bubbles. So I remember the guy um, who produces Krug, he said, women, please do not use lipstick when you're tasting my wines, because otherwise you're disrupting it. Um, and the other thing that, you know, messes with the bubbles is um, soap in your dishwater. So theoretically, uh, dishwasher. Theoretically, we should use only hot water to rinse our glasses. But yeah, sometimes, you know, we have food or something, so you want to put a little bit of soap, and soap does kill the bubbles as well. So it is a couple of different things. I, I cannot say, you know, it's definitely this brand, but because I'm sure in, in our different glasses in here, you see different shapes and, and you know, more or less bubbles, okay? All right, yes. Um, okay, residual sugar for this wine, eight grams. So this is a dry wine, okay? All right, yes, these are the vineyards in Jens, Tasmania. Any questions before we move on to Bollinger? Let me clean up my glasses because I have so many glasses now. Okay. 
Yeah, so insane for champagne says she loves the Spanian one. I think it is a great lineup. You know, I'm very happy with the Lambrusco too. I want to get salami and, and, and Parmesan cheese and taste it. So, yeah. Thanks to include Australian wines. Absolutely, Maria Cecilia. We love uh, Australian wines in here. So Alexa says it's delicious. Yes, thanks. I like it too. All right. Uh, yes, Jens is very good. I agree. All right. Okay. So, you know, I know it is hard to taste another wine. And I'm very sorry for those of you who are making this huge effort in the name of education. But it is really important that you taste the champagne. Sorry, guys. If not, I'll do the effort for you guys, okay? And I'll describe to you, all right? Okay. So, um, Bollinger is next, okay? So, as you guys were asking about how to open a bottle of champagne, I'll try to demonstrate in here. So, first of all, the bottles are, of champagne are covered by this foil. So, first thing is you have to remove the foil. So. Oh my gosh, I have double foil in my, in my bottle. Did I win something? No, seriously, I never saw that. Do you have that as well? I just removed the foil. Check this out. And I have double foil. They should put two bottles to, to me, not just one. <laughs> I will play the lotto. Okay, what are the numbers that I have to do? You have, guys, open your Bollinger. Let me know if you have double. No double foil for Mike. Okay, yeah, <laughs> Willy Wonka, yes, golden ticket, single foil. Okay, let me look, maybe it is a million dollars in here. No, it doesn't say anything. <laughs> I have double foil, this is so funny. Protection from Corona, yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so you remove the foil, okay? Now, if you, let me stand up. If you are a son, you have to show um, to your clients the label so they can see the label, they can read. Okay, it is Bollinger, that's the champagne I asked. Now, um, you always have to keep the cork and, um, and the wire together at all times, okay? So how do you do that? First, you loosen the cage, and that is six turns. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and you loosen the cage. Don't remove the cage. The cage is in here so that the cork doesn't fly out and, and goes, you know, popping into um, another place. So, okay, so you have the cork and the cage all together. You hold that with one hand, and then with the other hand, you will turn the bottle a little bit to loosen the cork, okay? And then, just little by little, okay, so yes, so good idea, okay, so uh, let me go back in here, so yes, um, hold the cork, you know, the label always to the client, don't turn the label at you, the label always to the client, and then little by little, you loosen the cork, and then you make pressure so that the cork does not fly out, oh my gosh, Okay, almost there. I'm trying to be very careful in here. And then you have to do not a very loud pop. And yes, you open the bottle of wine, okay? So yes, uh, not a very loud pop. Let me go back um, to the presentation. Okay, all good so far? Let me see the chant. Um, all right. Okay. Um, okay, yes, Jacqueline is saying she prefers to savor the champagnes. That is a great idea. The only thing is that, you know, I'm not going to do it in here because then I have to clean up. So, <laughs> so yeah, savoring champagne, uh, yeah. 
some people do it. All right, um, so I'm gonna pour the Bollinger in my vintage champagne glass, and uh, we can discuss what I think about it. So traditional methods, grapes in here, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and they have a little bit of a Meunier. Comes from France because Champagne can only come from France. Uh, Bollinger is very well known for putting their wines, uh, uh, the, the base wines with oak. So it is the style of a more powerful Champagne. So first you see a lot of Pinot Noir in here. So you expect a lot more body, a lot more um, uh, intensity but then also they use oak with the base wines, okay? The other thing about Bollinger as a house style, they use a lot of reserve wines. So, you know, wines from other vintages, that'll give a lot of complexity to the wine, okay? So, if you see in my glass, I have a lot of bubbles. And they are tiny, tiny, meaning, you know, this wine was in contact with the lease for many, many, um, many months. Um, they actually say that they age uh, for a very long time. Um, let's see, maybe 36 months or so. And they use reserve wines uh, back to 15 years, okay? All right, so aromas, what do you have? Baguette and camembert on the nose. Oh my gosh, you're going to kill me. I'm, I'm, I'm very hungry now. Maybe I should eat my pão de queijo now, right? Vanilla, agreed. Yes, cherry. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, very good call, Jacqueline, because in the middle of all of this, it's very hard to see the Pinot Noir, but it is in here, okay? Claudia Zarate, yes, brioche, toast, bread, vanilla, blackberries, agreed. Baked apple, yes, that is one descriptor for champagne. It is baked apple or the bruised apples, so very ripe. Okay, vanilla, pineapple, yes. You can swirl your, your wine glass if you like. Oh, this is so beautiful, yes. Hey, Carlos, how are you? We're drinking Bollinger in here after, you know, tasting one, two, three wines. So tough, you know, working Friday nights for me, it's, it's a tough work. All right, so can you see the difference in complexity between, you know, the Tasmanian was very, very good, but this is a step above, right? You have not only the fruit is here, because we said apples, we said pineapples, uh, but now you have all this vanilla and brioche bread yeast aromas. Yes. It is like a crunchy apple. I agree with you, Rhonda. All right, go ahead and taste the wine. I want to try. This is so good. Um, yes, this is very good. Smooth and creamy, agreed, Claudia. Uh, but you see, it has body. It, is, it has power, right? And that is what I'm, I'm talking about, you know, the house style of Bollinger. So this Pinot Noir dominant oak, it is, you know, they say it is a very masculine type of champagne. Um, I agree, you know, and it's very uh, good for me. So let's see, uh, Brenda says salinity. That is something that you can see in very good champagnes. So it is almost like you have a salty finish. Um, so yes, and that comes from the chalky soils of Champagne. Very good, Brenda. Happy quarantine, Maribel. Agreed. Yes, um, Natalie's asking about tannins. Um, not so much in here. What you can feel is more about, uh, you know, power. It's powerful. It it's, um, fills your mouth. Now, if you go back to the Tasmania one, the Tasmania one will appear to be, you know, very light and fruity. Finish is forever. I agree, you know, that it lasts and lasts. So you're not over it at. So Natalia is asking what champagne is my favorite. Um, so, you know, all of them, but um, I like this style of champagne. So I like Krug, I like Bollinger, 
uh, but I love Blanc de Blanc champagne, so only Chardonnay as well. Um, I, I love champagne in general. It's, it's one of the wines that we consume a lot in this house. So, yes. Okay, so Pedro is suffering a serious case of envy. You can order the wines, Pedro, for next time. Um, yes, of course. Okay, velvety bubbles. Exactly. That is, you know, very subtle. So you feel, again, going back into the texture, you know, the mousse that we were talking about. The Australian one was creamy, but this is so refined, so elegant. So, yes. Um, what's not to love about champagne? Agreed, Alexa. So Claudia is saying she's using the vintage glass and it's lovely. It is, it is absolutely uh, amazing for this because you st I still have the bubbles after pouring, um, you know, more than a minute ago. I don't know if you guys can see, but yeah, the aromas is great. How much is this one? This is expensive. So Bollinger is usually, you know, around $60, $70. Um, I think in the wine package, we calculate like 50 something. Uh, but yeah, Bollinger is one of the expensive champagnes not only because of the way they do it, right, with oak using um, other wines, uh, but yeah, this is something special. You know, unfortunately, I cannot drink Bollinger every day. I can make a class about Bollinger and every day and, and you know, and have the wine, but uh, this is, is the wine for special occasions, okay? So um, Nancy is asking why it is a special cuvée. So cuvée has, you know, is a word in French that has this meaning that is a special blend. Um, so, you know, the houses use that um, as a labeling term. So what is really special about this bottle is this in here, which uh, says that, you know, the Queen Elizabeth II, um kind of you know um yes approves of this wine and bollinger is one of the wines that yes is very much uh drunk in, in the uk and it is one of the of the wines for the queen together with paul roger um i think lanson so a couple of that yes sarah thank you i was waiting for you to help me here she says it's the royal crest so it's drank in the royal household. Yes, okay, so yes, we drink in this house as well, okay? We are not that royal. So nine grams of residual sugar, but you don't feel it, right? Because it is so balanced and everything, it is so, uh, it comes together naturally, okay? So Maria Cecilia is saying, how can I distinguish in a blind tasting champagne, Cremant de Bourgogne, or other sparkling? Okay, you have to come to Florida. You know, you have to fly to Miami so we can have. But yes, it is the salinity. It is the complexity. So, you know, go back to, for those of you who have the Tasmania one, go back. We thought it was pretty good. But, you know, this is a step up, okay? And yes, um, and so, you know, English sparkling wine, which is a big hit at this moment, it is, um, acidity is a little bit higher. Uh, it is a little bit more austere, but really delicious. So very good wines as well. So I wanna show you a picture of Lily Bollinger. So Lily Bollinger, she was a widow as well. So she was the head of business for uh, Bollinger for 30 years. So her husband died in 1941. They had no kids. So she decided to take over. And so from 1941, in the middle of the war, until 1971, she ran the company. So she is, you know, was one of these great women in Champagne that run the house and, uh, you know, and made it work through the wars and through everything else. So great inspiration. And then she, she you know, says um, great things about champagne too, which we'll saw um, later, okay? Okay, and one thing that I wanna show you as well is that Bollinger is James Bond champagne, okay? So you can see in here, Roger Moore, and I don't know who's the girl. Um, so he's drinking Bollinger. So since 1979, 
Bollinger has been the official champagne for James Bond. So I know he likes his drinks, uh, but you know, when he, he orders uh, champagne, it is always Bollinger. So um, this was in the movie Moonraker, Moonraker. Um, but yeah, we see uh, James Bond's every movie, there is a bottle of Bollinger. Yes, not shaker or stirred. In this case, he's drinking from a flute, but uh, they have, you know, celebrated. And this year, actually, there is a new James Bond movie coming up. They were about to release, you know, the wine and the movie together. Because of the, the COVID, they decided not to launch the movies yet, uh, but they are celebrating this partnerships, this uh, 40 years of partnership, okay? So Lucy, okay, I didn't know, does Sean Connery live in, in NASA? Yeah, I would love to meet Sean Connery and drink Bollinger with him as well. You know, we can fly to NASA when all of this is over. Um, yes, Bollinger 57 was in Goldfinger. Yes, you know, the man has great taste, people. Yes, he drinks Bollinger. Okay, so what do you guys think uh, about this wine in general, for those of you sipping it? Very, very good. Heavenly, Dalish, love it. Hi, Angelica, you missed the first few minutes. It's okay. Um, this is going, it's being recorded and we are going to upload on our YouTube channel as of tomorrow and I'm going to send you. Mike says, amazing. Mariana says, very good, delicious. Okay. Anna and Fred, what do you guys think? Wonderful. Love it. Delicious. It's okay. So if you didn't love this wine, it's okay as well. Some people think this is too powerful for them. And for people who um, are used to drink, you know, Prosecco or more lightly or uh, more fruity styles of wine, this may be too much. This is a wine that you can have with steak, with meat. Uh, it has body. It is powerful. It is not, you know, the thing like the, the Lambrusco, which is fun and good to have it on the boat. For this, uh, yes, you need to sit down, have a meal with it, okay? Rusty, I agree with you, best of the day. It is the best of my week for now. So I don't know yours, but you know, this is the best of my week for now. All right, guys. Um, so we have, you know, one last method, because I said it was complicated um, to go before we taste the final wine. And this is called the Asti method, okay? So the Asti method, it is not the... the, the um, the uh, champagne method, it is not the tank method, it is not the ancestral method, it is one method uh, on its own. One fermentation only that is interrupted by chili. And in this case, it is a ferment to order, meaning if I am in Italy, in Asti, and I have a production of uh, uh, Moscato d'Asti, uh, when the US wants to buy wine, they call me say, okay, start us, uh, um, begin fermentation again, you know, begin producing some wines, and I can do that, okay? So it is a ferment to order, very low atmospheres of pressure, meaning the bubbles are going to be, you know, not so much, you don't have all this pressure, so it's going to be uh, uh, different. Low alcohol, usually around 5% alcohol. So yes, you have, you know, a lot of sweetness, very low alcohol, great for desserts, okay? and usually done with aromatic grapes like the Moscato. So the wine we have in here, so Elio Perrone, Surgal, uh, Moscato d'Asti, DOCG. So the method is Asti, the grape is Moscato. That comes from Piemonte in Italy, and you have only 5% uh, ABV, okay? This is a pricey Moscato, because when people think about Moscato, they think about the cheap, um, stuff, right? The one that you buy for, I don't know, five, seven dollars. This one costs around 16, I guess. This is an expensive one. Again, we use that for classes. So, uh, and, and I think this wine is amazing. All right. So put your Bollinger aside for a second. Um, remember when I said that 
you know, for the ASTI method, you had low atmospheres of pressure. So you have a screw cap. You don't need the cork and wire to hold the cork in its place, okay? A screw cap will do it. So Jacqueline is saying no. So keep the Moscato for later, it's okay. You know, so drink the Bollinger then. So yes, you just turn, okay? So yeah, nice and easy. You can open, you can put the cap back, put it on the fridge, save it for tomorrow, okay? So um, I hear you, Jacqueline. She cannot put the Bollinger away. I hear you. Okay, so Moscato Dasti. This is a very good producer, by the way. So, yeah, can you see the foam in here? It's a little bit different, right, than the champagne. So you have a lot more foam. The bubbles are big. It is a different um, um, way to do it, okay? So, yes, that is the bottle. And it has only... 5% of alcohol. So this is one of those wines that, you know, you, you drink the bottle thinking it's just juice, right? Okay, so this guy is uh, one of the guys transforming the area and doing some very good um, things. He works with old vines and, you know, very low yields. So his wines are very fresh um, and delicate. So go ahead. Ah, okay. So first, smell the wine if you have it. If not, yes, leeches, roses. Okay, agreed, Brenda. It has that Moscato aroma. So, you know, we say that Moscato is one of the grapes that has uh, the grapey aroma. So it is like eating table grapes, right? Okay, so super floral, super, you know, super aromatic. Roses, leeches. Okay, go ahead and taste the Moscato. It's so good. I promise you it's good. So, um, yeah, floral, aromatic, elderflower. Yes, um, agreed. So for, for people who are Viognier, Torontes, Givert Schreminer lovers, this is the wine for you. It is super aromatic. Um, yes, so Antonio is saying you can probably finish a meal without a sweet wine. So, um, yeah, I didn't seem convinced, Pedro. Okay, you know, if you're my student, you see, when I say interesting, that's my thing, okay? So when I smell the wine in class and say, hmm, interesting, then it is something. And here I really, you know, I think it is a great wine. This one will be finished last, Rusty. I agree. You know what, this wine is perfect with, um, uh, prosciutto and, and melon. So think about things that have, you know, or a salad that has uh, apples or some sweetness, okay? For breakfast, agreed, Nancy, great for breakfast. Uh, you need something sweet, and of course, you need to cool this down, okay? So do not drink it at, you know, normal temperature. You need to but I think it is delicious. It is so fruity, creamy on the palate. So it is one of the best Moscatos that it is out there. And that is the reason why I use it for classes. So, you know, we can see that Moscato um, Dusty can be very high quality as well, okay? So Lucy is saying lemon tart with meringue, agreed. Yes, sparkling punch for a party. Yes, Rhonda, agreed, yeah. Very good. Okay, um, so Liz is asking if it is okay to swirl sparkling wine. So normally, you know, if you are in a restaurant, don't do that. They say you lose the bubbles. I do, but for, uh, you know, to be able to feel more the aromas and flavors, okay? Yeah, Sarah says day drinking when you don't want the high alcohol. Absolutely. So the wine has the freshness, has the fruit, has, a, you know, a little bit of sugar. It's very low in alcohol. Again, is a beach wine, right? It's one that you can uh, have by the pool. So it is a perfect for our weather here in Miami, right? So um, any co more comments about this wine? Uh, 
Um, Moscato d'Asti made in the same way as Asti? Uh, no. So um, there is the Asti Spumante, which is just lightly frizzante. It is the same process, but then it is a little bit less atmospheres of pressure. So one is, you know, is, is sparkling and the other one is just fizzy. Um, so it is a little bit different between the two. And Nicole is, is saying that it shows a great contrast to the Bollinger um, because all the wines has a purpose and a place. Exactly, you know, so we cannot drink uh, Bollinger all day, every day. Well, I know some people can, but, you know, um, if you're having um, a sweet or if you're having something, this is just the perfect wine for it, a brunch wine, right? So um, what is the residual sugar in the Asti? They don't say, uh, but it's usually high. And when I say high, it is 40, 50 um, plus, okay? So Jacqueline saying, is that a challenge? Yeah, we can challenge, you know, who drinks more Bollinger? I'm in. <laughs> okay, um, so we are running a little bit late. It is um, 7.40 p.m. in Miami. So I don't want to run over because I know, you know, we'll have places to go like Last Sofas or what's the name of Last Kitchens, right? All these places that we have to go tonight. Um, uh, but I wanted to share uh, with you guys one of the famous phrases that Lily Bollinger says. So um, she says, I drink champagne when I'm happy and when I'm sad. Sometimes I'm drinking when I'm alone. When I have company, I consider it obligatory. I trifle with it if I'm not hungry, and I drink it when I am. Otherwise, I never touch it unless I'm thirsty. So yes, uh, there is, you know, you can uh, drink champagne all day, every day. Remember, champagne only comes from champagne in France, but there is plenty of great sparkling wines in the world made in all countries. Yes, even in Brazil. Uh, you know, we have California, we have uh, now England making some uh, very special uh, sparkling wines, okay? All right, guys, um, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Um, so um, next week we have um, our Asake webinar. Hilermia will be teaching it on Wednesday, and then on Friday I'll be back with Bordeaux. Um, so I'm still selecting the wines because I, I would like to have old uh, Bordeaux for us to taste. And, I, you know, I'm trying to see with distributors if I can find a good price um, uh, old Bordeaux. I'll let you guys know. Uh, and then, you know, I'll see you Friday for the next webinar. Thank you so much. Um, yes, thank you, guys. Um, thanks, Arine. Very good. Yes, uh, yeah, of course, guys. And Nicole will also be back um, the week after that with roses. So, and we are, you know, um, we will see the methods for producing rose wines. And, you know, we are selecting some very uh, fun and interesting wines as well. So, yeah, stay tuned. You know, as long as we are um, home, uh, we will continue to do the webinar. So, I hope you can join us as, as much as as you can. So stay inside, uh, stay safe, and stay tuned, and we'll see each other again soon. All right. Bye, guys. Have a great night. Have happy weekend and happy Friday. Bye, guys. <laughs>